Hi, everyone. I'm Jeff Hunt, and this is the Human Capital Podcast produced by Goalspan. My quest on this podcast is to uncover the deeply human aspect of work. Today, we get to talk about how the businesses we lead can actually become more sustainable and more profitable at the same time. We will hear that these two are actually not mutually exclusive. We're going to discuss how to implement strategies that benefit the environment and also company culture, customer loyalty, sense of purpose, and ultimately profitability. My guest today is Lynn Yap, who is the author of the book, The Altruistic Capitalist, How to Lead for Purpose and Profit. She wrote this book to highlight how companies can create a positive impact for both the community and environment and how to grow business in a sustainable way. Lynn is also the founder of Activate Network, which is ACTV, the number eight. Activate works with companies to increase representation of women in leadership, technology, and innovation roles. They use leadership programs for women employees and even high school students to solve business problems, learn empathy and curiosity, and collaborate with people who look and work differently from us. Lynn started her career as a corporate lawyer after graduating from the University of Nottingham in the UK with a degree in law. And she also has an MBA from the Wharton School at University of Pennsylvania and has worked in innovation with companies such as Adidas and Estee Lauder. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you so much for having me today, Jeff. Great to have you on the show. And I'm really excited to talk about this topic because we haven't covered it on the podcast yet. And it's so relevant today. There's so much conflict for businesses around how do we do this sustainability thing well and still make money, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. Uh, A lot of times we think it's mutually exclusive, but it's not. Exactly. So we're going to jump into that. But before we do, take us back to the beginning of your career and share a little bit about if there was any one person or thing that inspired you to get into this space. Good question. I don't think there was any one person or any one event that actually inspired me to get into business as a force for good. Um, I think there are two things that probably led me to where I am today. I started out my, firstly, I started out my career in investment in, in as a corporate lawyer, and then later on in investment banking, and then later on moving into technology. Now, these are all fairly male-dominated industries. And as I was progressing throughout my career, well, I, I was looking out for women role models. Who is it that I can look up to? Who is it that, who can help me? And oftentimes there weren't that many women I could look out to or could help me, uh, uh, could coach me to to get into that next level. And the second thing is, as I was working in uh, law and investment banking, uh, I was also coming to a point where I was just working for the next big paycheck or the next promotion. Uh, and I was lacking purpose and, and meaning at, at work. Uh, and so that was another reason why I started to look outside these areas and to see how is it that I could use how I spend a lot of the hours of my day to create purpose, to serve others, to create a positive impact for the community and also for the environment. How is it that we can be more sustainable in the way we live and the way we work and how we are generally in the world? Tell us a little bit about your book. What inspired you to write it? Give us the thumbnail on your book. The inspiration for the book came in the spring of 2020 when, you know, the world went into lockdown. It was a really difficult time for me. I live alone and just so much uncertainty about the pandemic, about COVID-19 and what was going to happen. Everything was just looking quite bleak at that point in time. But what I also saw was a lot of hope and a lot of hope and humanity. There were neighbors helping each other, helping each other to buy groceries, helping each other to take care of their families, neighbors applauding and appreciating frontline workers. There was a lot of community and helping of each other. 
And the other thing that gave me a lot of hope was businesses collaborating with each other, sharing knowledge, sharing research, working with governments, working with each other in order to come up with the best solutions for, for the pandemic. So that gave me a lot of hope and inspired me to actually learn more about these businesses that were, you know, investing their assets and resources to help the community, to help solve this, this problem. And so I decided to interview entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, and also companies that believe in this concept of doing good for the community and for the environment. And what were the different mindsets that they had in order that they behave in this way? One of the things that you mention in your book is the difference between shareholder capitalism and stakeholder capitalism. Can you explain a little bit about that? Of course. And I think this is a shift that is, that's happened in the last few years. So shareholder capitalism really emerged when Milton Friedman penned an op-ed in the New York Times in 1970, more or less saying the sole responsibility of business is to maximize profits. And that is shareholder capitalism, where you very, very much focus on increasing the returns to investors. Now, what's happened in the last few years and the business roundtable a couple of years ago also then said, well, no, it's not enough that we focus solely on increasing profits for the business. We also need to create value for the other business stakeholders. So that's employees, that's consumers, that's community, that's the environment. And of course, there's also the investors. So how is it that businesses and companies can create value for everyone? It's about creating a win-win situation for all the business stakeholders and not just for investors. So you're taking it to a multifaceted decision-making process. Yes, indeed. You have to start engaging more actively with investors, with your employees, with partner suppliers as well. It's like, how is it that we can improve our supply chain to be more sustainable? If you're not behaving in a stakeholder capitalism way, you might have to start rethinking, okay, what are the partners that we need to work with in order that we can be more sustainable. So there is a lot of communication and working together under stakeholder capitalism that perhaps might not be as necessary under shareholder capitalism. For the CFO, if we can get really practical for a second, mm -hmm. how do you make the business case for the CFO who feels so pressured to make decisions to minimize the cost sometimes at the expense of sustainability. So for instance, we might be launching a new product line where I have a choice on the different packaging that we use. And one is 40% lower cost because it has less environmentally friendly materials versus the other. And so one of them is going to be more competitive or have a higher margin. How do you make the business case to somebody like that? I love that question. Uh, and that's one that often comes up, I think, with leaders trying to make a difference or make a shift in that business. It's always down then to the, the business case and, and trying to talk finance and ROI. In terms of sustainability, there are, of course, sustainability from an environmental perspective and then from a social perspective. I think the environmental perspective is easier, is an easier business case to talk about. From an environmental standpoint, the example that you, that you provided. I think what I would like to challenge as well is think about the business case in a different way. Think about playing the long game. There are a lot of things that you cannot expect to get a return immediately. And especially with something that is related to sustainability, if you're investing in more sustainable packaging or developing a circular product where there is creating a more circular economy that requires a longer term in order to see the returns, at least three years, I would say, um, when you're investing in something that's, that is requires that longer term thinking. Another way to look at the business case uh, when speaking to the, the finance community, I also like to say is what are the risks if you don't do this? Uh, and that could be looking at from a cost perspective. What are the compliance issues that could come up if you don't comply with environmental regulations? And secondly, this could impact how expensive raw materials be, uh, will be in the future. So if you don't invest in more sustainable packaging, more sustainable product or production, 
that could impact your profitability in the future. Say a little bit about the social sustainability side and the ROI is more intangible, but what are some of the things that organizations can do and what's the payoff of those activities? It's a really good question. It's very hard to measure the business case to, or to write the business case for social sustainability. We can say, all right, diversity will improve the, the business, but how is it that we can do that? We can invest in and, and check the box in terms of diversity. We have gender representation, racial representation, but when we're talking about, say, investing in inclusion activities, or we're talking about investing in training for our employees, we can invest in training, but what is the quality of the training that we're investing in? Those things are not measurable, but instinctively, we know that it should create a better business. It will make for better employees, will make for happier employees, and ultimately that will be better for the business, that they are more interested to stay at the organization that retains organizational knowledge and that creates loyalty and that creates more and a more engaged workforce. We instinctively know it's better for the business, but it's hard to measure that. And so I would challenge then the audience to think about what is the social case of social, social sustainability, not the business case, because you can't, if you're thinking about it from, from a tracking perspective, and I'm quite data oriented, how are you going to measure that? How are you going to measure inclusion? How can you measure quality of training and link that directly to a line on the financial statement? It is not possible to actually measure those things, but instinctively we know if we invest in quality training, if we invest in inclusion, rather than just checking the box exercise for diversity, we will have more engaged workforce, which should result in better products and services, happier customers, and eventually better for business. Yes. Even though those direct connections are sort of intangible, or I should say it's an indirect connection to the ROI, there are statistics that are very compelling about that ROI. For instance, Gallup has proven that highly engaged workforce companies are more profitable than disengaged workforce companies. And so the case that you're making really does have a financial ROI, doesn't it? It does eventually, but it's hard to make that direct link. Right. Makes sense. Well, it seems as though these types of decisions when executed well, have to be taking into consideration all of the other aspects of the business that are so important, like the marketing department. Are we actually communicating the fact that we're using more environmentally friendly materials and playing that up as a differentiator to our competition? Internal communications. Do employees actually know that we're working on some of these strategies? Because that could really improve our brand equity internally, especially as how employees perceive us as a company, right? Yes, definitely. Uh, I think there was a fear or there might be still fear about greenwashing, virtue signaling. And what I want to say about communication is two things, really transparency and being authentic. I believe that you need to be transparent in everything that you're doing. So be transparent about, all right, these are the goals that we want to achieve in terms of sustainability. We aim to be carbon neutral in X years. And if it doesn't look good right now, then outline what the steps that you will get to that. And I think the community, whether it's employees, whether it's customers, whether it's the supply chain partners that you're working with, will respect that. And one example I like to share is what Unilever did, what Paul Pullman did. He said, okay, we're going to double our revenue and half our carbon footprint in 10 years. And of course, this uh, was a little bit of a shock to the community, but what it did as well was brought his employees together. His teams came together. You know, it was, a, it was an ambitious, but it was also a, a goal that gave them purpose. So they came together, they worked together and figured out ways in which they could achieve that. That also gave the push to their supply chain partners to become more sustainable. How is it that they could work together with Unilever in order to make their production more sustainable? So that transparency was also very important in order for them to, to, to achieve their targets, which they did. 
And it really goes back to what you said earlier about this long-term approach versus the short-term, which is also something that Unilever did very well. A recent podcast episode, we were talking about how they shifted away from reporting quarterly earnings. Mm -hmm. So those mm -hmm. two are kind of hand in hand, wouldn't you say? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I think that's another issue with how we shifted from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. Because what happened with shareholder capitalism, when we're so focused on quarterly earnings and quarterly returns, that we become so focused on short-term thinking. And that means that we sometimes take shortcuts it, rather than thinking about what will happen in the next 10 years. Uh, and that really is, doesn't, doesn't bode well for the rest of the stakeholders, actually even investors, because really as investors, we want to, to be with the company for a long time. Most shareholders want to invest in the business for a long time rather than that volatile trading type investment. You're really making a case for integrating these things into the strategic planning process, aren't you? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it has to make sense. The other part I was saying about communication, it has to be authentic. You have to communicate your purpose and your business activities that are in line with what you're doing, with what your brand is known for, with what your business is known for. So what if I am somebody who really hasn't thought much about this topic? What's sort of the first step that I should consider taking as a leader if I haven't thought about this much? I would say, and I would borrow from Simon Sinek, start with why. I, I think the most important place to start is to understand what the purpose of the organization is. And leaders can do that by talking to people across the organization, not just at the senior level. Start to have conversations with different functions, different groups, different seniorities. Find out what values are driving the people, what, what is important to them. And from there, develop a purpose for the organization. Again, it should make sense with the business itself. It should tie in with the product offering. It should tie in with the service offering, tie in with the culture of the business. And from there, the strategy will evolve along with the processes, along with the operations of the business. I love that. Start with why, because oftentimes we're looking for complex answers to these things. And it's usually actually quite simple and right in front of us. Yes. I, and I'll go back to my story as to how I ended up in here as well. I mean, I, I was... You know, at the start of my journey, I was just working to the next promotion or to the next paycheck. But in the end, what we, a lot of us strive for is purpose and meaning. How is it that we can, we can serve and how is it that we can create an impact for others? Which leads to a much more meaningful life, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So Lynn, let's talk a little bit about the B Corp for a minute. I'm curious about your thoughts on what the role of the B Corporation is in affecting change. And just for edification for our listeners, I'll give you the definition of a B Corporation for those of you that are less familiar. Certified B Corporations are businesses that meet the highest standards of verified social and environmental performance, public transparency, and legal accountability to balance profit and purpose. B Corps are accelerating a global cultural shift to redefine success in business and build a more inclusive and sustainable economy. So Lynn, what are your thoughts about the B Corp? I think the B Corp plays two roles. One is a governance function in which then they, uh, companies that are certified as B corporations are fulfilling their purpose of, you know, protecting the environment and also delivering, creating value for the community. And secondly, I think what is very, a very important role that they're doing is educating and creating awareness for stakeholder capitalism. Uh, and I think that's very important in order to shift because we've been operating under stake shareholder capitalism for a long time, focusing on profits, looking at the short term, how is it that we can get a return? It was all about financials. And now they're shifting the conversation, shifting the way in which we do business. So I think the role that they play is creating that awareness and creating that momentum to shift towards a different way of operating business. One of the things, let's go back to your book for 
a minute. In your book, you talk about the many mindsets of mindfulness, curiosity, and grit. Mm -hmm. And I guess, first of all, what is a mini mindset? And then secondly, share a little bit about each of the, these three. Sure, of course. So for me, a mini mindset, is a way of being, it's a way of thinking it, from a company perspective, it then governs the way, the, the way company behaves and the processes that it, it has. And so in my interviews for the book and researching the book, there were three common threads that I, I pulled out from these interviews and the research, and that was mindfulness, curiosity, and grit. Mindfulness is really about being present, about having empathy for another person. And so how that operates in business is when you have an understanding and empathy for another person, whether it's the, the customer or for your employees, I believe that that creates better products and better services for, for customers. That's how mindfulness then helps businesses become better businesses. In terms of curiosity, this is really about listening. This is about looking for feedback. And again, this translates to being more transparent and enabling the business again to improve on how it does the business. And then finally, grit. And I'm going to take Angela Duckworth's definition of what grit is. Grit is purpose plus perseverance. And how I see perseverance manifesting in businesses that are forced for good is that they often are companies that collaborate. They have a mindset of partnering with other people, whether that's other companies, even competitors in order to solve a problem. That could be, for instance, in Best Buy. Best Buy was at one point being written off by analysts uh, at, the, at the doors of bankruptcy. And that was because Amazon was stealing a lot of market share for electronic goods. So instead, what they did was they partnered with Amazon to deliver and to sell electronic products, electronic gadgets. Uh, and that's how they were able then to also serve their purpose, which their purpose at, at that point in time was then to improve the lives of others through technology. They actually found a niche of helping the elderly market to be, to stay mobile for a longer time, to be more independent for a longer time. Are there other examples from your research and your book of just great companies that have done this really well, this combination of sustainability and profitability, the, the whole stakeholder versus shareholder concept? Many more companies are adopting stakeholder capitalism and one of the earlier companies that, that started all of this is Patagonia. Patagonia has been for a long time very much on purpose of preserving their environment and creating an impact. And you can see that in terms of their employee retention, they retain their employees much more compared to their peers in, in the industry. Um, they are able to deliver more innovative products and people love their products and, and they are more sustainable as well. Uh, and that has resulted in the company growing its, its revenue as well as profitability over the years. They're a great example. In fact, I think they just donated 100% of their daily Black Friday sales to, to charity, correct? Yes, yes. They have partnership with a lot of grassroots organizations focused on the environment, and they, they donated that to those nonprofits. Amazing example. Mm -hmm. And I think that translates then to also their messaging, their communication, going back to that. They continuously support local organizations that protect and preserve the environment. And that's consistent, uh, that creates trust within the community. Uh, and they've been doing this for many, many years. Which really ultimately makes it easier for them and any organ other organization like them to attract better talent, to retain that talent to be able to command higher margins in the products that they sell so that they can be more profitable and take care of their people better, right? Exactly, yes. Their brand value increases because of that trust that they've created in that community, not just with their employees, but with customers as well. And the community, people who do not normally go because they are originally an outdoor company, they also attract people who don't necessarily want to go hiking or mountaineering. Um, they also attract people like that too by their products because they believe in the cause that 
that they support. Okay, so I'm going to throw another difficult question at you because these are going to just come up. But <laughs> what what should companies do when they the pricing competition is severe and competitors are undercutting them because perhaps those competitors are compromising in some of the decisions that they're making, for instance, and it could be anything. They might compromise, like we said earlier on, the types of products that they're producing, or maybe they don't have pay equity internally. So they're paying, they're paying female employees less than male counterparts or something mm -hmm. like that. But there are so many industries that are highly competitive. Do you have any thoughts about how they can affect change? Sure. And that's a really good question. I think it's very hard for business leaders to decide what is it to do. We all have limited resources, figuring out what are the choices that we, uh, what, what decisions that we have to make. To that, I would say, again, think, play the long game. It's important to stay financially disciplined. Stakeholder capitalism doesn't need to ignore the investor. I think it's still important to stay financially disciplined and to be responsible about that. So as long as you're maintaining, maintaining that and thinking about the long term, that is the, that is the decision that, that should be taken. And because if you are compromising on, on your values, on your ethics, whether it's related to pay, whether it's related to environmental, I think it'll come back and haunt you in the end. So think about the longer term. If, if you take care of your employees, you would have to invest less later on to recruit new people. That affects your brand reputation. That could impact how you recruit your talent, how you retain your customers as well. So I would say, look, think about the longer term. Think about your brand reputation and your brand value. Stay financially responsible and make decisions around those parameters. Now, we haven't talked much about Activate and your passion associated with that organization mm -hmm. and helping women really enter into a greater presence in terms of leadership space. And I'm assuming you're also looking to improve board governance around inserting um, female leaders. But do you have any thoughts for our listening community about that and sort of your passions around that and what you're trying to do to affect change there? Of course. Thank you for the question. So, Activate Network is it's quite a special program really it's a program where women employees come together with high school students in order to solve a business problem so it's actually recently i just realized it's not just about gender talking about the gender equation it's also about how different generations can work together and and come up with more innovative solutions how we can learn to work with people who are different from us. We have what is tradition, you know, what is stereotypically the younger generation that is known to be creative, but the older generation can be creative as well. And they have wisdom in which that uh, we can use that wisdom in order to scale and implement those crazy creative ideas that the younger generation might have. So it's like bringing together different generations to come up with solutions and as we see in the workforce today, we have so many different generations working together. And oftentimes certain seniority, certain experience employees only work together. They don't, might not necessarily, senior and junior employees might not necessarily have so many touch points. And how is it then we can increase that interaction? And in these programs, because they are not related to the women's day-to-day -day task, we have a mixture of junior and more senior employees again how is it that we can bridge that gap across the generations to talk to together and 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 help each other so through those programs is creating a business value because they're solving a business a real business problem but is also the social aspect where increasing the confidence of the women to be better leaders um, in the future and also giving the high school students role models like this is some someone I could aspire to be in the future that's so cool well congratulations for Thank the you. work that you're doing that in that area uh, we've also seen we've seen companies successfully implement mentorship programs between 
more senior employees and young employees. And it really does go both ways because the more seasoned veteran employees have this business intelligence and wisdom and knowledge that the younger generations typically don't have. But the younger generations are stereotypically more innovative and uh, adopt technologies faster and can find information more quickly. And so there's this mutual sharing that can have a tremendous benefit, isn't there? Yes, indeed. Yeah. And it's also about learning to see things with a fresh perspective, because if you've done things for so long in the same manner, having working with someone who hasn't done it before, hasn't seen it before, could also then bring up questions like, oh, why don't we do it this way? Is there another way to do it? And then the second, a second thing that I've observed in these programs as well, it's the curiosity to learn, inspiring inspiring the women to also, well, let's learn something new because the students, for instance, in the programs, they're hu hungry to learn new things, to absorb knowledge, to, ex to learn new skills. So I think that also uh, that energy, that enthusiasm to learn, to continually learn is shared then with the more seasoned. <laughs> sure. It's <laughs> contagious, isn't it? Yes, exactly. Yeah, very, very <laughs> true. Well, let's shift into some lightning round questions before we wrap up. So I'm going to throw some questions at you. You give me top of mind answers. The first one is, what are you most grateful for? Oh, good question. Uh, so I'm grateful for so many things, but I have to say, given where we are today still with the pandemic, I'm grateful for the health, for my health, for the health of my family and my close friends and, and the people around me. Yeah. What is the most difficult leadership lesson you've learned over your career? <laughs> that, that, that's another good one. I learn that sometimes it's better to wait to hire the person that's the right fit for the role that you're seeking than to hire someone that's just there. It is harder to undo that. And I, I learned a lesson that it's perhaps better to wait until the right candidate comes along in order to fill the role that you need. It's not good for the candidate that you hire if it's not the right fit. And it causes you more headache as well in order to make that work. Patience always pays off, doesn't it? Patience, yes. <laughs> I guess that's a, that's a good word. <laughs> Patience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for sure. Who's one person you would interview if you could, living or not? <laughs> uh, Michelle Obama. I think she's very inspirational. Uh, do you have any top book recommendations? So one book that I read this year, and I probably do a book a month, one book that I read this year was Thirst by Scott Harrison. And it is how he started Charity Water. The, the one sentence that resonated with me in that book is, um, we cannot be afraid of work that does not end. And when we are trying to solve problems like climate change or discrimination, we cannot be afraid of how big the problem is. We have to believe that if we do a little bit every day, we will make a difference and we can make a difference. Reminds me of the story of the, the person standing on the beach with all the clams that are there dying and he's throwing them one by one back in the water and somebody comes up and says, well, what are you, why are you doing that? You're not making a difference. And he says, well, I just made a difference to that one. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. What, speaking of, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Maybe it is something that my father told me when, way back when, when I was a little girl, that it doesn't matter what is it that I choose to do as long as I put my entire effort into it. And it doesn't matter whether or not I, I succeed in that goal that I, that I set out for myself, as long as I know that I gave it my best effort. What is the most important takeaway, Lynn, that you'd like to leave with our listeners today? I would like to say that no one is too small to make an impact, um, that we can all do something to make a difference. We don't know who is watching us pick up the litter on the street and how that influences someone else to do the same. So we don't know how small actions that we have can impact someone else. So I would say that just take a step, share with someone what you what good you have done today, 
try and mentor a student in your community, anything at all, because that could really make a difference. It's back to, again to like the, <laughs> the clam story. You don't know how you can help someone else. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you, Lynn, for all you're doing to change the world and for coming on the show today to share all this wisdom with our listeners. Thank you so much for having me, Jeff. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for listening to the show this week. We release new episodes every other Tuesday. Let me know what you thought of this episode by emailing humancapital at goalspan.com. Human Capital is produced by Goalspan. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And please share this podcast with your colleagues, team, or friends. Thanks for being human. Kind. <laughs>